Today we will look at our Christian worldview of truth. Now, when I say Christian worldview, I am talking about how we as believers in Jesus Christ, born again, spirit-filled, view the world through our lens, through the lens of the scriptures, how we view truth. The worldview is, is various and numerous. They view it in all kinds of different ways, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But what is our Christian worldview? And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, this morning. We all, and we all have a worldview, by the way. You may know it or you may not know it, but you all have a worldview. Uh, the way that you view this world. I mean, you might be a, a young person. You view this world differently than an older person does because you only have so much knowledge, so much experience. You know, so many things have gone on in your life. And so you have this view of what the world is. As a teenager or an adult, you have a different view. You have a little more knowledge, more experience. You read a little books here and there. You know, you sought after some understanding. And so you have a, a certain worldview. It depends on your background, whether you were raised rich or whether you were raised poor. Uh, if you're raised rich, you, you probably ended up believing that, that Republicans are, are the way, the truth and the life, you know, because they're the ones that free you up to make more money and capitalism and so forth. If you're raised poor, then you probably thought, no, Democrats, you know, I'm raised a Democrat because they're for the poor, they help the poor, they, they you know, they give them the, their needs in, in a sense because they can't get it themselves because society keeps them down. We all have a worldview, you know. I was in that that poor category and and we were raised democrat and it wasn't until i became a christian then i changed my affiliation and not necessarily republican but i changed to a christian worldview that's my political affiliation is what would jesus do you know though i'm registered a republican to tell you the truth but it's not because i'm rich and it's not because i'm poor it's because i have a christian worldview now so we all have worldviews um, just as anyone else. So what is truth? Let me define a, a word for you. It's, and this word is, is called relativism. How many have heard that word, relativism? You may not even have heard these words. No one's heard of the word relativism. Okay, good. A few. They're willing to admit it. Relativism. Uh, the idea that truth is a historically conditioned notion that does not transcend cultural boundaries has existed since the Greek era some 2,400 years ago. And I think it goes back further than that. But relativism contends that all truth is relative except for the claim that truth is relative. And this is by Dr. Edwards Yonkins. So what he's saying here is that relativism, the idea of that truth is a historically conditioned notion. You're conditioned to believe a certain way. And it's not bound by, it's transcendent cultures. And each culture will, will, will define it differently because they're a different culture. They were raised a different way and different things happen to them and it's been around. So that's what relativism is. So we're talking about relativism this morning. So relativism is the view that truth is different for each individual, social group or even historical period, has its beginning during ancient uh, Greek periods. And, and that's what we're dealing with today, aren't we? Today in our society, we have a different type of truth because we're a different society compared to the early 1900s, a different type of truth. And then you can go back and so forth, depending on the culture, depending on the period, depending on the men, the, the founding of this nation totally different uh, idea of what truth more of a biblical truth than what we have today <clears throat> uh, when Richard taught uh, in our men's breakfast he did a great job on on defining humanism and, and humanism kind of is the, is the uh, the top part of the, I guess the pyramid and then you would put the relativism and all these other thoughts underneath it because ultimately it's humans in philosophy and their definition of religion and, and God and, and life and what truth is in that manner it, it, it all falls under them because they're making those decisions on what relativism is or what truth is you know, now there's as he explained to me earlier you know um, and it's true humanism can be good too because we're all human we have certain roles to play and characteristics that God has given us I, I kind of liken it to <clears throat> to God you know God is God 
And, and, and if you think about it, there are things about God that we will never understand or know. There are things about God and his character that we can never achieve or even do, uh, like being omniscient. Uh, there's no way we can be omniscient, omnipresent, all-knowing. You know, we, we can't do that. Those are characteristics that we have no idea or understand them, only God. But then there are those communicable attributes, like love, right? God loves, he is love. We can love too, and we can be kind. Those are attributes that uh, God has given us as human beings that are his, his characteristics. And so, in a sense, uh, humanity can love and have compassion and so forth, and those are good things. But as far as humanity making their own way to heaven or having their own spiritual walk based upon their truths, that's not correct. That is an error in humanism. Let me define humanism philosophically. A variety of ethical theories and practices that emphasize reason, scientific inquiries, and human fulfillment in the natural world and often reject the importance of belief in God. And so taking all of those things together and, and coming up with a philosophy of what life is. Let's go ahead and look at John chapter 18 this morning. I want to give you the context because I want to give you some Bible this morning and not just kind of lecture you. <clears throat> we find here in John chapter 18 that Jesus and his disciples go to the Kidron Valley there in the garden. Jesus is about ready to uh, pray to the Father to receive the cup that uh, the Father has planned out for him because he loved the world and um, gave his son so that we could all have eternal life. At this point, the, the supper is over. Judas is left. He's going to go grab a group of soldiers. He's going to come to the garden, and he's going to lead them to arrest Jesus, who will uh, carry him away with their torches and weapons. This is where Peter springs into action, and he literally uh, cuts um, Malchus's ear off, and then Jesus puts his ear back on him, changing his life, I'm sure. For eternity. Now, Jesus quickly uh, <clears throat> uh, follows the soldiers into the temple, uh, in, in a sense, hand and uh, hands bound and legs uh, shackled, and being led to the slaughter, like uh, the scriptures tell us, a lamb led to the slaughter. And the first place that they take Jesus is the house of Ananias. A Ananias was uh, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, a high priest, and we see that from chapter 11, who was also a former high priest. Peter follows Jesus, but he follows him outside the gates at a distance, and this is where he denies uh, Jesus three times before the rooster crows. And meanwhile, inside the house, Ananias questions Jesus about his disciples and the things that he taught, and he's basically on trial from this point on. He's being tried, in a sense, to be qualified for the sacrifice that he is about to uh, perform on the cross. The soldiers take Jesus to see Caiaphas, and from there they take him to Pontius Pilate, the Roman emperor of the province of Judah. Uh, it's his job to determine an appropriate sentence for Jesus because uh, he was accused of criminal acts. And so Pilate wants to know uh, what Jesus has done, what are the accusations and the religious authorities tell him that Jesus um, has nothing more than a common criminal and he really needs to be crucified. And this is where Pilate tells him, well, if he's a criminal, then you uh, judge him according to your law. But they understood that they have no authority to stone him or crucify him or execute him. So, so they push Pilate to... Uh, to judge him as a criminal and then crucify him on the cross. And so Pilate goes back into the praetorium there and he begins to question Jesus on some issues. Now, Pilate is a Gentile. He's not a Jew. Uh, he comes from the Roman Empire, comes from a whole different worldview in a sense of what truth is. And so he's viewing this from his lens and where Jesus is viewing it from the Father's lens and what God has for him in this great plan of his that nobody seems to be getting at this moment. And then the Jews are viewing this from their lens as Jews hoping for the Messiah, thinking that Jesus is not the Messiah who would fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament. And so you have these worldviews all going on at one time. And Jesus with the right Christian worldview. 
And so Pilate is questioning Jesus. Uh, the Jews are questioning Pilate, and there's just this great big debate uh, going on. And of course, Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And that's an interesting question. At that time, the, the Roman emperor was the king. In fact, he was God, in a sense. The Jews believed that the Messiah uh, would be the king and lead them into victory and, and, and uh, rule and reign in the land at one point. And so Pilate, taking Jesus aside, asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Just point blank. And Jesus answered that his kingdom was not of this world. And I, I love that he didn't say no and he didn't say yes. He just kind of said, well, my kingdom's not of this world. And in a sense, he's saying yes. So you are a king is what Pilate asked. And Jesus said this, you say rightly that I am a king for this cause I was born and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And so Jesus is basically saying, yes, I was born for this reason. I am a king. I came into the world to bear witness of the truth. And anybody that knows the truth that understands the truth, that has the truth in them, hears my voice. That's important. That's important for us as believers. Do we know the truth? Do we have the truth? And do we hear the truth? Can you recognize the truth when the truth is being given to you? Or are you blinded by your feelings, your emotions, your worldview, what you want or what you don't want? It's important. Jesus was basically challenging him. I'm bearing witness to the truth. Well, who's the truth at this moment? Well, Jesus was pointing to himself. Here I stand, truth. He says, and if you want, you need to bear witness to that truth, Pilate, because I am truth. And if you understand truth, then you will hear my voice. And Pilate said, what is truth? What is truth? Now, we never get an answer to that question. <laughs> I wish that, that John would have elaborated there a little bit. I don't know if Jesus said anything. We don't know because he doesn't say. But it would have been nice if Jesus would have gave, given us a nice little definition of what is truth, you know, so that we can just really say, okay, this is what Jesus said truth is. But he has, and, and, and we'll find it throughout scriptures as we go through it. And again, Pilate goes outside, tells the religious authorities uh, that he can't figure out uh, what Jesus has done wrong. He's, he's feeling really generous that day. So he says, you know what, why don't I just release one prisoner, which is a custom? How about Jesus? And they all said, uh, uh, no way. We don't want that to happen. Um, we'll take uh, Barnabas and you can uh, go and crucify Jesus Christ. And so that's what's taking, on, he, taking place here in John chapter 18. We're going to focus on verse 38 where Pilate asks Jesus, what is truth? What is truth? Now, some commenta commentators, um, we, we don't know the, the intent here of what is truth. We don't know if he's asking in a sense, hoping for an answer. As one commentator said, no, he's just making a statement. And he's not necessarily hoping for an answer. Uh, he doesn't care if there's an answer. You know, he's just making a, a blunt statement of, well, what is truth? You know, that, that type of attitude, like, uh, like, I don't really care, but what is truth? Whatever. You know, he wasn't really drawing for it. We don't know. It, it doesn't really tell us. We could probably get deeper into the Greek. I didn't have time to do that. Uh, it could be that he was seeking truth. But Romans had a view of what truth was. They understand truth a certain way. And so it could be that he was just making a flat-out uh, sarcastic type of statement as what is uh, truth. But it's good for us to look at that. And as I said earlier, now this is not an exhaustive study on truth, but I hope that, that I'll encourage you to investigate it. There are so much resources out there just on the word truth itself. But what is truth within the context of the scriptures? That's what is important for us to know. So Pilate asks, what is truth? Someone said, you cannot change truth, but truth can change you. I like that. Because truth, you can't change. If truth is truth, you cannot change it. It it's, has a solid foundation. It's unmovable. And it will not change, especially it's, it's coming from God. And that's the truth that changed me. Because truth will change you. It will move you to do what is right. It will move you to serve the Lord. 
Biblical truth is constant and unchanging. If we know what truth is, it will change us just as it changed my life. I did some strange things because I believe the truth of God's word. When God revealed to me that I was a sinner and fell short of the glory of God, I knew I was going to hell. I knew that I deserved to go to hell. I mean, it was very clear to me. In fact, that was the first understanding of God that I received. And then the second was the reality of how much God loves me to send his son to die on the cross for me. And then receiving that into my heart, it changed my life life it changed my view it changed my perspective on life you see i thought before that life was about making money and so i had uh, worked hard trying to figure out a way to make money and by the grace of god not knowing it at the time i got a job with southern california edison working for the electric company and i started making money so much money that we were putting away Uh, quite a bit of money so that we can buy a house and so much money that I could go out and party I can go out and drink I can go out and you know uh, buy a little bit of dope you know a little bit of cocaine and I can experience on that experiment on that type of stuff go out with my friends and I thought it was about making money and having fun and partying Though I loved my wife and I loved my kids and they were a part of my life, they weren't a part of it at that time. They were kind of my responsibility and I took care of them, you know, and I provided for them and and I loved them to death, but I wanted to make money and party and have fun. I'd married my wife at the age of 18, had my first child at uh, 16. And so I missed out a lot. And so I wanted to make up for that. And so as I was trying to make up for that, I ran into a lot of bad, bad things. And so then God comes into my life, and that view totally shifts to where I don't want to go out and party anymore. Because the truth is, I should be focused on God and on my family. And I started doing that. I started focusing on God, reading his word, just boy, going through it within six months, reading the whole Bible, and then continuing on year after year, just reading and studying, and then getting the word from, from the radio and from church and so forth. Uh, I couldn't get enough church. I was in church every time those doors were open, I was in church because my view changed. Family, I wanted to know how do I become a good husband? How do I become a good father? And so I changed. I started reading books. Uh, Dobson is a great one on family and so forth, listening to Focus on the Family every single day, listening to KKLA, I can't remember the, the stations, and just trying to understand what it is to be a father, what it is to be a husband, and then applying those things to my life. My life changed. Truth came in, and it changed me completely. We don't have that as much as we did back then. It was during the end of a revival, the hippie movement, and there was like residuals of of revivals taking place in people's lives. And we still have a few, but it's rare today. People come to the Lord and they're like, give me heaven, that's what I want. And then they go and continue to live, you know, as though they haven't understood the truth. They haven't applied the truth. They're just living their life like they did before. There's no change because the truth hasn't come into them. It hasn't changed them yet. And that's what you need to seek is that truth and life-changing truth that takes place in your life. What I want to do is uh, take a look at truth from a very few historical uh, beliefs and very briefly just so we get an idea of the different cultures and what they believe concerning truth. And again, look <clears throat> when you think about these cultures and, and what they have done historically, you have an understanding of why they've done these things. Because their truth, their understanding of truth dictates uh, their actions. And that's what I was trying to get at earlier. When you encounter the truth and it changes you, your actions change. You want more of God. You want more of family. You want to change. You know, I was thinking about my, my dress you know, when I was growing up in, in high school, <clears throat> my wife and I, we met in junior high and then we reconnected in high school and we used to hang around uh, a group of guys and gals <clears throat> that were a part of gangs 
uh, one guy was actually the head of, of, of uh, a gang there in Walnut. <clears throat> and we used to wear the, the khakis with, I don't know, some of you probably don't even know, winos, which, which were like uh, uh, little cholo shoes, you know, or hush puppies. And we, we used to crease the, the khakis or crease the cord. Uh, the, uh, they had cords back then, Levi cords corduroy jeans. Uh, Virginia used to wear those. They were cuffed. We always cuffed them, ironed them with blue starch spray real tight, you know. She'd wear the stretchy belt with a little V on it. I'd wear my stretchy belt with an R, that type of thing, you know. I went and got a little tattoo with her first name on there. We just did things like that. And, and we dressed a certain way because of our worldview, what we thought was right for us. Well, when I became a Christian, it changed completely. I didn't dress that way anymore. I knew that I, that wasn't my life. That wasn't my view anymore. My view was God's view. What is my Christian worldview now, even on how I should dress, how I should dress appropriately, how I should dress not to reflect a certain nationality, but just to reflect uh, appropriate, moderate dressing. Even that changes. So your actions change depending on your truth. Real quickly, Greeks. Let's go way back then since I uh, defined it and, it and it said that we can go all the way back to the Greeks, 24 BC, 2400 BC. Basically, the Greeks believed in accurate perspective. Their perspective, uh, if they can accurately perceive something, that is what they believed truth was. In the Greek uh, conception, truth is properly generally ascribed to linguistic states or language. A proposition P is true if only, if and only if P contains in the empirical observable world. Okay, what did you just say? Okay, truth has to do with some sort of correspondence between thinking and expressing in language is what he's saying here. The state of affairs in the world. So a person who accurately perceives something, that could be their truth. I don't know if that makes sense to you to a certain degree. If we have an accident out there and some of you are outside and some of you are in here and we view the accident from those different perspectives, the people from this perspective will view it differently from those outside. They'll have a perspective of what they think happened where the people out there will have a different perspective. <clears throat> I used to have a friend that was a police officer. He said one of the, one of the questions or, or visuals that they give you on the test to become a police officer is what would you do if if you had your gun drawn and there's a guy coming out because a bank just got robbed and this guy comes out and, and he has his hands in his coat and he's like just looking at you you know and he's not moving you're telling him stop 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 get your hands up get your hands up but he's not putting his hands up what would you do and he keeps coming at you would you shoot him and oftentimes they say yeah we, we would shoot him well this is what you didn't know he was deaf and he couldn't hear you and so perspective of what truth is. And so you have to understand the whole scenario. You didn't know he was deaf, so why would you shoot him? You know, until you see a gun, then you would you know, shoot him or warn him again. <clears throat> so their perspective. Romans. Romans, in a nutshell, factual events. Um, one commentator said that their truth is in what they perceive to be factual uh, kind of the Greeks evolved into a little bit more of, of factual. The Jews, now the Jews are closer to us than, than not, but the Jews basically, especially the Orthodox Jews, truth is revealed in God's word and is found in the Hebrew Bible and in the words of the Talmud. Uh, for uh, Hasidic Jews, truth is also found in the pronouncement of the spiritual leaders who is believed to possess divine inspiration. So they add a part to that truth in that their spiritual leaders can can give you truth also. Now that's kind of like our Catholicism, right? Uh, yeah, we believe the Bible, we believe Jesus died, but the Pope can also be truth too and they can override the word of God. We don't agree with that. <clears throat> Christian, this is our worldview, Christian worldview. We believe that the teachings of the scriptures, the death of, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, who is the word, is truth. Christians' truth is based on history, revelation, and testimony from the Bible and are central to Christian beliefs. That is Christian truth. A.W. Tozer said, let God be true. Every man a liar is a language of true faith. So we believe that 
Jesus is truth. God is truth. The Holy Spirit is truth. The Trinity is truth. The Word of God is truth. And everything that is written in it is truth. And so we have to run or allow God to run our lives through his word. Everything else, as A.W. Tozer says, is man's idea of truth. We know God is truth. Uh, When you look at God, the Trinity of God, God is a source of all truth and he is present everywhere, knows all things, totally understands what is real, right, true. Therefore, whoever or whatever he says is absolutely true if he is God. Uh, Just from the perspective that we have of a God should tell us that if there's a God, he should know all things and everything that he knows should be true as God. God is true and without iniquity, the Bible says, Deuteronomy 32, 4. He is just and he is right is what the Bible says. So God has no sin, No unrighteousness, he is fair and he is just. And because of his character, he is truth. And so we can depend upon the truth of God. Now, coming from the Trinity, if that is true, that God is truth, Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, then, of course, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are also truth. Where I found truth, there there I found God, Augustine said, who is the truth itself. Deuteronomy 32 4 says he is the rock his work is perfect for all his ways are just a God of truth and without ingest righteous and upright is he. Deuteronomy 32 4. This is our God. God is the truth. He is the truth in the physical sense truth in his being. He has a real substance and gives a being to others. He is the true in the moral sense. He is true without error, without deceit. God is the pattern of truth. God is all truth. Uh, There is nothing true but what is in God and comes from God. Now that's an interesting statement. Think about that one for a second. Nothing is, there is nothing true but what is in God or comes from God. So all truth comes from God that's in him. All truth that we have comes from God. Anything other than that is not from God. So we need to know the truth. Jesus is truth. Jesus said it himself. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's probably one of the easiest definitions of Jesus as being true is that Jesus himself said, I am truth. And so again, from within him and from him is truth. So every word that Jesus spoke is true. And we remember Jesus even said, everything that the Father has directed me to do, I do. And so that's true also. So Jesus equates himself with the truth, who is God. And also the Lord over all. <clears throat> John eighteen thirty seven. Pilate therefore said to him, are you, the, are you a king? And Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born. And for this cause I come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So Jesus is truth. For us as believers, Jesus is truth, God is truth, and the Holy Spirit is truth. Let me give you one scripture concerning the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, 1 John 4, 6. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And so if you hear God's voice, if you hear that he's truth, and you acknowledge that truth, then you have the spirit of truth in you. If you don't acknowledge it, now what do I mean by not acknowledging it? If someone confronts you on the issue of truth or an issue in your life or a struggle and it's true and you don't acknowledge it, then you're listening to the wrong spirit. You're listening to the spirit of error and not the spirit of God, which is truth, who's trying to get you back on track. And so what spirit are you listening to? The scriptures are true. Uh, Of course they are because they're from God and they're written by God. Uh, C.S. Lewis said, uh, no philosophical theory which I have yet come across is a radical improvement on 
the words of Genesis, that in the beginning God made the heavens and the earth. Boy, if you can believe that, then you should have no problem believing everything else. Uh, Peter, we, we talked in length about Peter and, and how he believed the scriptures were inspired of God and what they were profitable for. Paul <clears throat> also said that, um, you know, Peter, that they were um, not written by man, but inspired by the Holy Spirit. So, so as believers in our Christian worldview, we know truth to come from God, from Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, and from the Word of God. And so it doesn't uh, do us wrong to believe what the Bible says what the Bible says, and of course with its context and what it's uh, trying to say as a main point. Let's look at real quickly the secular truth, and this is where we kind of err. Uh, even as believers, we, we kind of bring in some of this stuff into our faith, and we need to get rid of it. We need to, we need to understand it, we need to know it, and we need to get rid of it. So there is, there is a secular truth. Again, relativism is a concept that points a view have no absolute truth or validity, having only relative subjective value according to differences in per perception and consideration. Again, relativism. Uh, basically, again, it's your view based upon your understanding, your perception, what you believe is right by your experiences in the culture and so forth. So if my truth says I can take your wallet from your pocket and look at it, and then say, this is nice, and take the money out and say, this is really my money, here's your wallet back, and I can put it back in there, because that's my truth. For me, that's true. And you're going, wait a minute, you can't do that. That's wrong to steal. Where'd you get stealing it's wrong? Well, from the Bible, wait, wait a minute. We don't believe in the Bible. We don't believe in God. So if we don't believe that stealing is wrong, then who's to say, I can't take your money, and it can, can become mine? because that's my truth. And that's what we've done with relativism. We've created our own truth. Now, you know it's wrong because it's yours, and you don't want to give it up. You know, why would you want to give it up? And your reality is, no, that's mine. I worked for it. It's in my wallet, and so you can't take it, because there's an underlying uh, biblical principle there that has been established for centuries in our cultures that stealing is wrong, and that is a truth. <clears throat> the moral relativism, a, or as moral relativism. The term is often used in context of moral principles where principles and ethics are regarded as, as applicable in only limited context. There are, are many forms of relativism with the variety and, and degree of controversy. And there were so many out there, it's like you can't even exhaust it. And so I'm just going to touch on a couple. So truth is always relative to some particular frame of reference, such as language or culture. So understand that. I hope you're getting this. Cultural relativism, what the culture believes as a culture. As I said earlier today, our culture believes certain things. The culture relativism is a view that no culture is superior to any other culture than compared, comparing systems of moral morality, law, politics. Uh, we're not different than any other culture, but every culture has its own understanding of what belief, uh, what truth is, and that's called cultural relativism. Be careful that, that you don't bring in those cultural relativisms into your Christian world view. You have to be very careful. Uh, one example, again, would, would uh, probably be abortion. Ab abortion would be a cultural thing right now. Earlier in the 1900s, abortion was illegal because the culture believed it was illegal. No, because the Bible says it's wrong and we don't do it. And the culture believed what the Bible said more than what the culture said. We've changed though, where the culture now says, no, it's okay. And so we're believing that. And so now as believers, and there are believers that think that it's okay to have abortions or marriage, another cultural uh, relativism. On top of cultural relativism, there's socialism relativism. Someone, someone, I like this, someone called it the godfather of politics. <laughs> you, know, you know the movie Godfather, right? And it's whatever the godfather said, that's the truth. You know, in, in a sense, that's our politics today. They prescribe truth to us. Proposition 8 is the perfect example of that. Here the people voted and we voted against it and we won, but then the government came in and says, no, that's not right. And they went ahead and implemented it anyway, even though it's still in, in the courts. 
So that's social relativism. What the government says is right. A lot of us have some of that in our in our belief system, especially if you're poor. We have this idea that the government owes us something because we're poor, you know. And so um, I'm going to take advantage of that. And that's far from the truth, especially from a Christian worldview. What we need to do is work hard, you know, come up with an idea and pray and seek God and how he'll bless us. Now, I do agree that there are some things that we need to take advantage of in the culture, especially when you have no food and your family suffering and and, and various issues. It's a touchy place to be, but understand our Christian worldview is we work hard. The Bible talks about working hard and applying yourself and praying to God and he will be your provider but not allow the government to be your provider that should be far from us they shouldn't provide for us at all but yet there are circumstances where they do <clears throat> i relativism now here 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 it kind of gets a little closer this is this is where i have an understanding of what truth is it's inscribed truth, what an individual believes to be right or to be wrong. Again, it comes from your background, how you were raised, whether you, you were wealthy or whether you were poor, uh, whether you worked all your life or whether you didn't work at all, Di- different perspectives. Uh, I do understand this, that that can change in individuals. You know, I raised four boys. And I raised actually five boys. I raised them all exactly the same. They didn't change because they were all together. And so I raised them all the same. But it's interesting that they're all different. Their personalities are different. Their ideas are different. Their worldviews are even different in certain uh, situations. Uh, Some have uh, their Christian worldview is is an extreme to one point and others have another extreme to the other point. It's It's interesting how we take these views and we make them our own and then we believe them. Uh, The sad part is when we do stuff like that is that we start judging others because they don't believe in them, you know. And so because we have this extreme view on something, we want everybody else to have that same view and not everyone's going to have that same view. But I relativism basically is saying, look, this is what I believe is truth. Uh, Not what God says, not what anyone else says. This is what I believe to be true and then there's one that's probably the most dangerous of it all <clears throat> and i think we're seeing more of it today and it's full full modern hyper relativism and this new new term i guess that has come up and that is where anything goes anything goes and so you're you're witnessing this this relativism of of everything together everything is fine whether it's i whether it's social whether it's you know um, cultural, whether God's involved in it because churches, <laughs> you know, are, are approving same-sex marriage. It doesn't matter. Whatever feels good, do it. It, it just doesn't matter. And, and that's the worst of it all because um, not that we're reverting, but we're, we're going to a point where we're just animals. You know, we're just animals. And so you have Christians who are living with each other before they get married because it's whatever we're in love and they use the excuse you know the bible never talks about going to the government and and getting a certificate to be married as long as you're committed and blah 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 but it does talk about following the laws of the land and it does talk about marriage in in the beginning it does talk about giving a ring just as uh, judah did and so forth then there is a certificate of divorce if there's a certificate of divorce then there is a certificate of marriage you know that you have to understand so you know again it's the cultural thing it's all that goes this is what i makes me feel good and and so forth and it's the worst of all the relativism so <clears throat> let me close so how important is truth obviously it's very important and as you can probably tell you're like okay i'm totally confused <laughs> you know this just kind of whoosh, went over my head I, I hope that it didn't because i know that i'm not that great of a teacher to to really get it that high <laughs> you know i kind of bring it down in the table where the crumbs are so that you understand it but it is a matter of life and death that we understand this that truth will only be found by those who diligently seek honesty those who diligently seek to walk with god in his truth god promises that you will find him 
if you read your word and if you're praying to him and if you're in church and you're studying uh, the things of God, the truth will be revealed to you. The psalmist said, teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may live according to your truth, to your truth. And that should be our heart as believers is to learn the things of God. I understand TV, I understand movies, you know, all these vampire movies and all that stuff. They're entertainment, they, they, they occupy time, they get you through, you know, but it's nonsense. It's a movie. And to base your truth upon these things, it's an error. You know, teach us your ways, O oh Lord. You know, your ways, not secular books, you know, not secular teachings and understandings and so forth. We need to get more of the word of God.